I played 12 games of Pokemon Emerald at the exact same time. But I turned the chaos up to another level, because in this version of Emerald, everything is randomized. That's right, the starters, the wild Pokemon, the gym Pokemon, the movesets, the abilities, the items. It's all random, and it's all happening across 12 games simultaneously. Will I triumph in this mess, or will fate judge me unfit for the chaos of the dark, twisted world I've created? I'm a 10-year-old getting my first pet, but Trico, Torchic, and Mudkip are all gone. In their place are three random Pokemon. In a challenge like this, where a million things happen simultaneously, catching new Pokemon is... hard. So, I have to hope that this free Pokemon is actually decent. Now before I tell you my starters, I need to admit something. I'm not playing 12 games. I'm playing 13. There's a secret game running alongside the other 12, but I won't look at it until all the other games are done. All the same inputs are running to this game, so will it make it to the Elite Four like the others? Or will it spend hours fighting level 2 Weedle and running into walls? Let me know where you think this game will end up in the comments. My options are Sharpedo, Masquerade, and Yanma. Everyone gets to join the party, with 5 games getting Sharpedo, 4 games getting Masquerade, and 3 getting Yanma. I accidentally don't nickname most of them, but at least Yanma gets to be Pickle, or a Pickle. So there's a lot of RNG in the actual Pokémon, but let's talk about an even scarier factor. The Overworld. I'm trying to navigate 12 of these tiny idiots at once, and so much can go wrong. Wild Pokemon attack in some games, but not in others. Then I'm in the menu trying to run away, but those directional inputs go to other games. And now they've hit a wild Pokemon. The cycle can spin on and on, causing me to lose my mind and regret all my choices. So make sure you subscribe, so at least I get some validation that my pain causes other people's joy. We're off to Rustboro, and I have a few overworld tricks up my sleeve to stay in sync in as many games as possible. The first is cornering, my most important strategy. Corners on the map allow me to use directional inputs, but stay in the same location. Not only is this the best trick for making progress on the map, but it allows me to stay in place while games that are behind can catch up. Thanks to cornering, everyone is together, and we can progress. The trainers in this game have random Pokemon as well, meaning an easy youngster Joey fight could become a run killer with a Rayquaza. Luckily, the trainers on Route 102 don't have anything too terrifying. In Petalburg, Wally still can't catch a freaking break, and I use the cornering method to slowly make my way through the woods. There's a few trainers here, and sometimes they're really strong, like this trainer with a fortress. My bugs have a tough matchup here, which sends me all the way back to Petalburg. Luckily, I have a second overworld trick I can use. This one is start menu pausing. By clicking start at the perfect time, I can put some games in the menu, but not others. Now I can navigate the straggler games back, and the games that are ahead just move through the menu, instead of moving in the overworld. I want to move in sync as much as possible, and start menu pausing helps with that. Just over the hour mark, we're through the woods and into Rustboro. Now it's time to take on the first gym, but Roxanne's Pokémon are randomized, so thankfully my bugs won't have to deal with rock Pokémon. Roxanne has three Pokemon, a Why Not, a Corsola, and her ace is Camerupt. Since I'm moving the cursor in all 12 battles, I have to select a move in the same slot across each game. So while a Sharpedo Crunch kills, Air Cutter from Yanma certainly doesn't. Selecting moves is all about maximizing your total damage. The Sharpedos have no issue taking out the Corsola and Camerupt, as they know Water Spout, an absolutely insane move that will make things much easier. However, my Masquerains and Yanmas have a major, major problem. Not only does Camerupt know Fire Blast to absolutely annihilate them, but Corsola also knows Overheat. My bugs stand no chance against these Pokémon. So, I need to catch something else that can counter the fire attacks. This early in the game, there aren't many strong wild Pokémon, so the best I can do is Route 116, where I find the water Pokémon Krabby and Walrein, and the ground Pokémon Donphan, that seems to have the ability Drizzle. All of these will be helpful at countering fire Pokémon, but currently, they're too weak to make much of a difference. But I persist, and as my Pokémon levels get into the mid-teens, I finally start to win consistently. After fighting Roxanne for about an hour and a half, we finally get the first badge in all 12 games. 
As I continue, something else I need to watch out for is deleting moves. With so much going on, it's hard for me to notice when something like this is about to happen. Here, I deleted Water Spout on Sharpedo for Smelling Salt, which will have huge ramifications because Water Spout is the best move ever made. It takes another 20 minutes to save Pico, and 10 to get back to Petalburg. Here, I make sure to pick up some repels, but somehow I have vastly different amounts of money in each game. Now I sail down to Duford and repel through Granite Cave to pass off the letter to Steven in record time. Brawly is our next gym leader, and he starts off with a horrifyingly appropriate Pokemon, Machamp. High Jump Kick absolutely destroys my Dark-type Sharks and my additional team members. Brawly's Ace is also a Fire Pokemon, very cool. I do have Dawn Fan now to counter Fire Pokemon. Unless, of course, that Fire Pokemon knows Water Spout, getting a super effective, rain-boosted, 150 base power attack. Water Spout is the worst move ever made. Rounding out Brawly's team is a pretty easy slowpoke, so after a few tries, my Masquerain and Yanma games start to pick up quick wins, as Quilava doesn't have a better fire attack than Fire Spin. The Sharpedos are still struggling to get past Machamp, but if they get a crit or high jump kick misses, they get past Machamp and easily take out the rest. All things considered, it's not too bad, and it only takes about 45 minutes to beat Brawly 12 times. In Slateport, we find Team Aqua curiously missing water Pokemon, but defeat them and head out to Route 110, where my rival has a Mewtwo now sometimes. She demolishes me at first, but her team really isn't that hard, so a few tries later, I can move on to Mauville. Watson has four Pokemon, Chinchou, Dragonair, Tentacruel, and Pidgeotto. While I lose very badly on the first attempt in every game, Sharpedo can ultimately 1v1 each of these Pokemon. And after a few tries, all my Sharpedo games are victorious. The Masquerain and Yanma games obviously have a harder time, but by focusing on one game at a time, I can methodically take victories. It takes a bit of time to go game by game, but now I have the third badge in every game. The Mauville Pokemart doesn't have repels, so I need to go to Verdant Turf to get them. Repels are critical for the next part of the game, as you have a bunch of places to travel, including the Fiery Path, Route 113, and Meteor Falls. Thanks to Repels, I can get from Mauville to Maxi in under an hour and a half. But that brings me to the next hurdle of the run. Not only does Maxi have a legendary Pokemon, but he has the one with a huge type advantage across all my games. Articuno knows strong flying attacks to take out my bugs, and somehow it curls its claw into a fist to punch Donphan with ice. The Sharpedos can squeak by the Articuno, but Maxi has a Breloom in the back, ready to pedal dance them to death. I'm still able to win two games initially though, and after a few tries, I can win in my Sharpedo and Masquerain games. Thankfully, Masquerain learns Sacred Fire to take out Articuno. My Yanma games are really struggling though. I'm particularly struggling in one game, as Yanma and Donphan are too disadvantaged to win. So I go hunting for strong wild Pokemon with an advantage over Articuno, and catch a Pseudowoodo, a Lombre, and a Gyarados. These Pokemon may be weak, but on their first try, they bring home a victory, and Maxi and his scary bird are done. With the randomization of this game, it often feels like little puzzles I need to solve, which is a lot of fun. Next up, we have the pleasure of taking on Flannery, who in this version of the game is just Roxanne. Okay, not quite, but she is Roxanne in the sense that her team is very underwhelming. Her team's major weaknesses include water, bug, and ground moves, and that's not a problem for my team. I actually beat Flannery in five games on the first try, and four more on the second try. Two of the final three games are wrapped up on the third try, and the final Sharpedo game only takes a few extra tries. Less than 30 minutes after first entering the gym, and we have the fourth badge in all games. We can pop over to Norman's gym now, where his team has a lot of the same weaknesses as Flannery's. Sharpedo, Kingler, and Donphan can take out the fire Pokemon, the Bugs can take out the Absol, and Porygon is just bad. We get another quick badge and set our sights on Fortree City. To get there though, you need to use Surf. Luckily for me, I've had to deal with enough fire Pokemon to make sure that my teams are stocked with water Pokemon. I only need to catch one extra Pokemon, and teach Surf in all the games, and off we go. On Route 119, I ran into a double battle where the trainers had a Whizcash and a Fortress. As you know, my team struggles against Bug and Steel types. 
I ended up losing half of these battles, which means I had to go all the way back to Mauville. When some games fall behind, I take my games that are ahead and lead them into a building, like a Pokemon Center. In this case, it's the Weather Institute, and this keeps the ahead games in place, since the walls of the building restrict your movement. Just don't run into those Team Aqua grunts. We defeat Team Aqua and take on our rival again, but this time around, she's ditched the Mewtwo, so we only lose in one game. I do have to navigate back, but soon after, we're all together in Fortree City. Next up is Winona, and she actually has three flying Pokemon. Her ace is Dragonite, which is really, really unfortunate. Dragonite is super strong, and it has a great tight matchup against most of my teams. It also knows strong stab attacks like Aerial Ace and Dragon Claw. It also knows the 140 base power move Sky Attack, just for good measure. This thing is a true monster. Sharpedos have the easiest time, as they can take out Winona's first four Pokemon in one hit. Dragonite obviously isn't so easy, but Winona's Dawn Fan sets up the rain, so Water Spout still does good damage. Sky Attack is also sometimes a blessing. Winona will see a kill with it, and because it's a two-turn attack, she won't be able to heal, so I can close the fight out with Sharpedo. Yanma and Masquerain do struggle, but the rest turn from Sky Attack allow me to use my weaker Pokemon to get off a Stun Spore or a Defense Drop from Rock Smash. Then my strong Pokemon can come in and win the fight. And sometimes the weak Pokemon do too. Beating Winona takes just over an hour, but we have a long journey ahead to Lily Cove, going down Route 120 and Route 121, and stopping Team Aqua at Mount Pyre. By the time we get to Lily Cove, almost two hours have passed. Now the plot requires me to fly back to Lava Ridge Town, which is a problem because... Despite having two flying type starters, none of my Pokemon can learn fly. No problem, right? I'll just catch something. So I send my little Marco Polo out to find me something good. I check the grass and water encounters in Route 121, 120, 122, Mount Pyre, 123, and Lily Cove City. And there's nothing. The best thing I could find was a super rare Vibrava, but most of the time I wasn't even able to catch it. Although I did find a Shedinja whose random ability was Wonder Guard. Finally, after almost an hour of looking, I found on Route 118, all the way back by Mauville, there's a decent chance to find Tropius. So to make sure I don't waste any Pokeballs, I go game by game back to Route 118, catch Tropius, teach it fly, and fly to Lava Ridge Town. After way too much time, all my games are there. And by there, I of course mean hanging out with my grandparents in a hot tub. A totally normal activity to participate in. I buy some super repels to get through the magma hideout. Maxi no longer has his Articuno, so I'm able to beat him on the first try in eight games, and on the second try in the remaining four. I also defeat Team Aqua with no problem. Now that all that's done, I can sail to Moss Deep, where I can take on the seventh gym leaders. Tate and Liza fight you in a double battle, and in this challenge, double battles are extra tough. There's already a lot going on during regular battles, but in double battles, I need to select a move and a target for 24 Pokemon. There's just no way to keep all that straight. So, I just need to hope that they have weak Pokemon. Just kidding, they have a Grimer and a Psyduck. And a Magikarp. And I beat them in 12 minutes. Things are looking up for me, as I help Steven defeat Team Magma once again. It's time for me to start using Dive, and thanks to good planning, I already have a lot of water Pokemon. However, I don't want to give up Water Spout or Crunch on my Sharpedos. And since I need to add both Dive and eventually Waterfall, it makes sense to catch something else. So I go out on another scouting mission, and this one is wildly more successful, as I find a Kingdra on the second route I check. I quickly catch these in all my Sharpedo games and teach everybody dive. With repels, the overworld movement is super easy, and I head underwater and up to the seafloor cavern. Here, I do some strength puzzles and take a few tries to defeat Archie, causing the world to be both sunny and rainy. Then I go to Sutopolis, head to the Sky Pillar, recite the entire plot of Emerald, and hey, the world is fine again. All thanks to Rayquaza, who, as a reminder, will not be a Rayquaza in this randomization. I have the opportunity to catch a level 70 Pokemon in this game. Let's really hope it's not terrible. For now though, I need to focus on the 8th gym leader, Juan. Juan does have a water-focused team, 
but outside of Walrein, it's not very good. The Walrein is also one of Juan's lowest level Pokemon, so my team can tank hits pretty well and take it out with not too much trouble. After about 30 minutes, we've defeated Juan in every game, and now we have all eight badges. The only thing left to do is beat the Elite Four, and the quickest way for me to do that is to get my Rayquaza encounter. I'm obviously hoping that this is a good Pokemon, but I'll be even happier if it's a pre-evolution of a good Pokemon. Remember when I said that even items were randomized in this game? Well that means there was no Master Ball for me to collect in the Aqua Hideout. So I'm gonna have to catch this thing with an Ultra Ball, and that means the worse the Pokemon is, the better my catch rate is. And I have rare candies, so evolving it won't be an issue. I slowly scale the Sky Pillar, praying that luck is on my side. When everyone is at the top, I walk up to Rayquaza and... Okay, I can live with that. It would be the worst case scenario if I killed Pinsir. So I start throwing Ultra Balls right away. And surprisingly, the catch rate seems pretty good. After a few more Ultra Balls, I've actually caught all the Pinsirs. Except for one. Pinsir actually kills all my Pokemon here, causing me to white out. Does that mean I can't use Pinsir in this game? Nope, I can just fight it again and catch it. We did it, we caught a level 70 pincer, but its ability and moves could make or break this final stretch. And this pincer either has guts or huge power. Uh, I'm gonna go with rigged. This must be rigged. Pincer is a fast Pokemon that relies on its attack, so these abilities are so insanely good. Its current moveset isn't anything to write home about, but a bug type attack and a healing move are a great start. Making my way through Victory Road takes a little bit since I refuse to teach Flash. Just about an hour later, and I have reached... Before I take on the Elite Four, I have some preparations to make. Currently, my teams are filled with the level 70 Pinsir, my strong starter, maybe one other high level Pokemon like Donphan or Kingler, and a bunch of lower level HM users. Every slot in my team is important, so I want a more complete roster. The highest level wild Pokemon can be found in the bottom floor of Victory Road, so I send my little Chris Columbus down there to check it out. There's actually some decent Pokemon down there, including Kingdra, Gengar, and a Lanoon that knows Explosion. Stab Explosion is pretty good. I spend some time bringing my little minions down there to catch these extra Pokemon. While I'm doing so, I also realize that Groudon is down here, but it's a rare encounter. Although I am able to catch two in the same game. My teams all consist of Pinsir, my starter, my strongest other team member, and three Victory Road Pokemon. Now that the teams are in place, there's a few final things to do. Most importantly, I need to use my TMs and HMs to make the best movesets possible. But Pinsir is my ace, and its moveset is critical. There are two moves I want to get rid of, Future Sight and String Shot. The TMs in this game are randomized just like any other item, and one of the TMs I found is possibly the best move in the game, Spore. Spore is the only 100% accurate sleep move, and of course, the bug type Pinsir can learn it. But I still need a strong second attack to pair with Twin Needle, and it needs to be a physical move to take advantage of Pinsir's stats and ability. The best move I have available to me is Strength. So with Soft Boiled, Twin Needle, Spore, and Strength, this Pinsir might be unstoppable. The final checklist items include selling all my useless items to buy as many revives and hyper potions as I can, and using all the random rare candies I found on Pinsir. The team is ready, so let's do it. Let's take on the randomized Emerald Elite Four. Obviously, with 12 games happening at once, the more consistency, the more success. If the same thing happens in every game, I can always make the right call. But here, some of my pincers have huge power, meaning their attack stat is double the other pincers. The huge power pincers can get kills where the others can't. So while that's great, all my games are thrown off. What am I supposed to focus on? Here's my general plan. I want to focus on the games that are currently doing the best, and pick the best moves for those games. In this case, that would be the games that have moved on to the second Pokemon. By doing this, I ensure that my top games are in the best shape possible. And if the other games lose, who cares? 
This isn't a Nuzlocke, I can just try again. For Sydney, once I get past Blaziken, his team is either weak Pokemon or Pokemon weak to Twin Needle. So on the first try, not only does everyone get past him, but Pinsir is still alive in every game. Some Pinsirs also get burned from Blaziken, but thanks to Guts, that just makes them stronger. Sydney is a cakewalk. Phoebe is not so easy. She starts with a Bug and Steel Pokemon, Scizor. With my Bug and Normal attacks, all I have are disadvantages. It's almost always worth it to put Scizor to sleep. But when I try to attack again, Phoebe likes to switch to her Misdreavus. This is also a tough matchup for Bug and Normal moves. So I just start slamming moves and see what happens. The rest of her team can be taken out by Pinsir, but some of them die to Misdreavus before they see the rest of her team. That means I have to bring in other team members, and that is certainly not consistent across games. Once the dust settles, only one game has fallen to Phoebe. Next is Glacia, and I'm still focusing on the games that are ahead, which is now games where Pinsir is still alive. Pinsir can take out Pidgeotto with a Strength, but in one of the games, Strength PP is completely depleted. I only fought 10 Pokemon, and I have another attacking move, so there's no way this happened naturally. Something odd happened here, but I don't know what yet. Glacia's team is largely weak to bug moves, so the games with Pinsir alive make it through handily. It's too much for some of my other teams, and another four games get sent back home. Drake also has a pretty manageable team, but some of my games are already bleeding out, and this is where they fall. But three games make it, so I carefully heal these teams to conserve my items. And now it's time to face the champion. He starts with a Metapod that can be Okoed across the board. Then we see Corsola, who I put to sleep and then knock out. Ariados can also be Okoed, but Weezing can't be taken out consistently. Wallace heals up though, and if I hit the range, I can take Weezing out. Kingdra is also a range to kill, so sometimes we Oko. Steven's final Pokemon is just Teddy Ursa. Nobody on Steven's team is a real threat, so we take wins in all three games. My plan produced wins on the first attempt, so if it ain't broke, why fix it? The second attempt sees a 100% success rate against Sydney, but the issue has always been Phoebe, especially because of her Scizor and Mischievous. Here's where I see that Mischievous knows Grudge, which removes all of a move's PP if the user faints, so that settles it. Spooky ghosts make my PP go away. This time, everyone makes it past Phoebe, but some teams are in such bad shape that five teams lose against Glacia, a much easier opponent. Of the remaining games, three make it to Wallace, and since I healed them, it seems impossible for them to lose. On the third attempt, I once again have three teams make it to Wallace, where two pick up quick wins and the third actually struggles. No, literally, my pincer is using struggle because all of its PP is gone. I still win though. On the fourth attempt, I get two wins, which just leaves one game left. Ironically, it's the same game where this pincer killed my team while I was trying to catch it. Stronk actually gets burned by the first Pokemon in the Elite Four run, activating Guts, which means I can keep it healthy with Soft Boiled and go on an absolute tear through the Elite Four. We've only been fighting the Elite Four for two hours, but we pick up our final win and stop the clock sub 30. 29 hours, 23 minutes, 26 seconds is all it took to beat 12 randomized games of Emerald at the same time. But wait, don't close this video yet because we need to see if that secret 13th game also beat the Elite Four. Uh, well, it looks like we're still in Little Root Town. Okay, well, at least we have a Pokemon, and it's a level 15 Masquerade. This dude did nothing for 30 hours. If there's such thing as an anti-speed run, I'm in contention for the world record. If you enjoyed this video, please check out the other videos in this series. Also, it would be amazing if you liked the video and subscribed to the channel. Thank you all so much for watching. Goodbye.